listening to Data Framed, a podcast by Data Camp. In this show, you'll hear all the latest trends and insights in data science. Whether you're just getting started in your data career or you're a data leader looking to scale data-driven decisions in your organization, join us for in-depth discussions with data and analytics leaders at the forefront of the data revolution. Let's dive right in. Hello, everyone. This is Adele, data science evangelist and educator at DataCamp. When we talk about data maturity on the podcast and the process of becoming data-driven, we often lose sight of the sheer amount of effort and work it takes to build a strong data science function within an organization. Building data teams, creating connection with the rest of the organization, evangelizing the data team's work, training others on data literacy, and building a data culture is no easy feat. But today's guest approaches building high-impact data science functions with the clarity few have. Glenn Hoffman is the Chief Analytics Officer at New York Life Insurance. He is an experienced senior executive in insurance and financial services who currently leads the corporate 50-person data science and AI function at New York Life. He is responsible for the foundations, relationships with many internal groups, and a great variety of projects, and also leads their Data Science Academy, their internal education program for all New York Life employees. Throughout the episode, we talk about how he built the team at New York Life Insurance, the different skills they optimize for, delivering career pathways for data scientists, building ML ops and model governance teams, how to build relationships and market the work of the data team, the ins and outs of the internal data science academy, and much more. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to rate, subscribe, and comment, but only if you liked it. Now, let's dive right in. Glenn, it's great to have you on the show. Great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I'm very excited to speak with you about your work leading data and New York life insurance, how to organize effective data teams, delivering impactful data science use cases within life insurance, and much more. But before, can you give us a bit of a background about yourself and what got you to where you are today? Let me start with uh, the current position and how I got to that, and then I can go a little further back if needed. Yes, I've been at New York life uh, a little over five years. Actually, even before coming here, I was watching the life insurance industry for a bit and was sort of, you know, excited about it. And then uh, it seemed like the right moment, you know, about five years ago to join the industry and do some data science. Because, I mean, life insurance is a, it's a fairly traditional industry, but now over the last few years, it's been ripe for change. And the nice thing is it has a, a great variety of interesting problems that we'll talk about more. And we can build the first solutions, right? So New York Life is a pretty big place. You know, it's one of the Fortune 100 financial companies. So there's lots of challenges. And most of them we tackle for the first time. So I think that's really exciting to me, you know, to be at a place where you can be truly innovative and build first solutions for really interesting problems. So that's kind of why I joined the company. And, you know, since then I've built the function and the team. A little further back, I mean, I've been in, you know, data science and what we used to call statistics for a long time. I started out as a stats professor, you know, a long, long time ago, did five years of that and then joined industry and basically did every job. Uh, I was a a hands-on predictive modeler early in my career, you know, eventually got more and more responsibility. And then probably over the last decade or so, I've been building data science functions for, for a few different companies. That's really great. And you mentioned here the exciting nature of working in data science and life insurance. And I'm excited to first discuss that. So I'd love to first understand the lay of the land when it comes to the use cases and applications of data science within the life insurance industries. What are some of the exciting data projects you've overseen at New York Life Insurance? And where does data science and AI really provide value for life insurers? First of all, you know, my team, the Center for Data Science and AI at New York Life, we are here to provide data science and AI expertise, solutions, education, and work with a variety of business partners to essentially build you know, data-driven solutions that make decisions in all kinds of processes. So, so that's the idea. The idea is to create value for the company, you know, mostly through data-driven automated decisions that function in real-time or in batch and, and business processes. I'll give a, a variety of examples of that and why they are exciting, at least in my view, right? So there's a lot of different things we do. We support a whole bunch of different areas in the company. So for example, the first one is our distribution system, right? We sell life insurance through agents, and we have built solutions for agent recruiting. We've built solutions to predict agent productivity. So it's exciting from a data perspective because it uses a lot of behavioral data and some transaction data. 
exciting from a perspective of algorithms because this is actually neural network models that we do on that front. Then we have underwriting, and you know, for life insurance, underwriting means mortality prediction. So that is and triaging of various data sets. So this means medical data, right? So from a data perspective, it's exciting because it's a great variety of medical data. And from an algorithm perspective, it's you know survival modeling, a classical and machine learning type. So that's cool. A third example might be COVID modeling, right? The last two years, as you might imagine, at a life insurance company, we've had a pretty significant project trying to model COVID mortality. We've worked with medical doctors and government affairs people. And that is obviously, you know, very exciting, very, you know, current data, very interesting data. And from an algorithm perspective, we did hierarchical-based pandemic modeling, which is very, very sophisticated in a statistical model. And, and then there is there's marketing modeling that we do. There's fraud modeling. You know, fraud modeling is an, another very exciting problem because there you're looking for a needle in a haystack, right? The huge, overwhelming majority of transactions are perfectly fine. No problem at all. They should happen. But every once in a while, in a very small minority of cases, there's somebody trying to attempt to, you know, fraud. And, uh, you know, there was a whole other set of techniques that we used to try to figure that out, right? So this is just a handful of projects we have going on right now. There's obviously much more, but that sort of shows the great variety and excitement in those projects, both in the, on the algorithm side as well as on the data side, and certainly on the business problems that we're trying to solve. That's awesome. And you mentioned here a few use cases that create new value, such as COVID-19 modeling, to use cases that accelerate value by reducing costs and generating more efficiencies. So, of course, delivering on these use cases requires a high-performing data science team. And this is something I'm excited to deep dive with you on and really break down. So I'd love it if you can walk us through what you found to be the hallmarks of a successful and impactful data science function, especially within large and complex enterprises like New York Life Insurance. I guess I start with saying it is the third data science function that I'm building in my career. So I learned a lot from all the mistakes I made the first two times. And I think we, we did a lot better this time around. I think there was three big aspects of putting a successful data science function together. First is obviously talent. So hiring great data scientists and great data science managers and leaders is important. But then also data scientists don't operate in a vacuum. So also hiring bunch of other skill sets to make it work. So I'm thinking of you know, machine learning operations engineers, data engineers, project managers, model governments, you know, a little bit of training and development. So I think all of these are important talent to have to make a team successful. The second is platform and technology, right? We set up a platform both for you know, model development as well as probably even more importantly for model deployment into production. So we have all the, you know, the regular development platforms, you know, the Python environment, the R environment, geospatial environment. But then we really spent a lot of time over the last three years, I would say, on creating a deployment platform that allows us to easily put every model we built in production, both in production on our side, as well as in production at the business partner that's, you know, using the models every day. So that's the second one. The third one is relationships, especially in a large and complex organization like New York Life, relationships inside the company to our various business partners and other stakeholders. So we spend a lot of time and effort on communicating pretty consistently and frequently with our business partners, both in the creation and designing of projects, the execution of projects, and then post-project, you know, the use of our models and products. So I'd love to unpack this with you, you know, given the diversity of the roles and stakeholders on any given data project or team, how are these different roles organized at New York Life Insurance? Do you have a centralized data function, you know, like a center of excellence or an embedded model where these different roles are embedded in functional teams or something in between? From a corporate perspective, the function that I lead, the Center for Data Science and AI, is a corporate function, right? So we support, you know, almost all of the company with, with data science and AI. So that's sort of centralized. From a data perspective, there is a corporate data team, and then there's a few individual data teams that are closer to the business or the function, right? So I have a little data team in my organization that takes advantage of what the corporate data team produces, but then that's sort of the last mile of data processing, if you want, that we need. And then within my team, I have 
a specific machine learning operations team. Uh, so that has a leader, you know, who is an experienced engineer, and he's got like, I believe, seven engineers, you know, on his team that are completely specialized in machine learning operations. I have a, a project management office that is, you know, led by a, a manager and have several project managers on that, have a change manager on that. And then we have a development team that basically does a lot of training and community building for my team as well as the rest of the company, you know, around data science. So the nice thing, I mean, I, you know, we have some scale, we, you know, that my team is about 55 people. You know, if you count factors, then it's probably about 75. It creates a necessary scale to have career pathing for all these skill sets, you know, on the team. So let's say, you know, a junior data scientist that might join the team or even a mid-career, you know, data scientist that joins the team has many options, you know, both from a, uh, the type of work they do in terms of what area they build models in and the company, as well as a, a career progress, right? So they become really senior data scientists that works on more complex stuff. They become a manager, they can become a manager of managers, you know, all the way up to my spot, right? So we have a good career track for everybody, you know, on the team. We also take care of continued education. We do tuition reimbursement. We allow people to go to conferences so they can top up their skill set. That's great. And you mentioned here creating development tracks for a lot of the talent on the team. When do you start thinking about creating these pathways? And when should data leaders building data functions start thinking about these pathways? And what are the lessons that you can share from your experience? I think this is sort of important when you think about you have a centralized team, if you have, you know, small teams in different places, you need to have at least one, you know, sort of central team that has critical mass to enable the career passing, to enable the funding for platform uh, and to enable all the support, you know, that you need. I started thinking about that right from the start when I put the team together, right? So I designed my team or at least, the, you know, for the most part in this way, right from the start. There are a few functions we added later uh, as we gain, you know, scale. But the general concept was there from the beginning. I think it is important because if you're joining a five-person analytics team somewhere, then you do have to wonder what are you going to do two years or three years down the line. That's definitely true. And harping on the MLOps team and MLOps functionality you've added in the data team at New York Life Insurance, this strikes me as relative to where the industry is at as a sign of a mature data science function to have dedicated talents towards deployment. So can you share the process of building such a function and what were some of the best practices you learned along the way in building an MLOps team from scratch? You know, I think it's been important for a while, but now we have much better technology that actually makes it a little easier to make this reality. And that has evolved you know, tremendously over just the last few years. The importance for me, and the reason why I put so much focus on it, I see a lot of data science team out there that build really interesting, exciting models, and then never deploy them into production. And data scientists get frustrated because they build something, something that nobody uses, and business gets frustrated because they don't get any value out of the data science team that they built, right? So I, I, I wanted to avoid that completely and say the focus is on productionalizing. We want to build great models that we can have trust in and that are diligent and sound, but uh, they have to be deployable. Otherwise, there's really no point. So pretty early on, you know, as soon as the first model has got to a stage where we worry about you know, where they're going to go, started building this MLOps function, which sort of sits in between the data scientists and you know, the pure technology folks. The MLOps function, helps the data scientists, works with the data scientists every day to build models that are ready for production, both from a code perspective, uh, because you know engineers can typically write a bit better code than data scientists can, but also from a data perspective. Is the data that's being used ready for production in that form? And what are the concerns that are going to come up later when we productionalize? And then we also invested in platforms. So now we have a Kubernetes-based you know, deployment platform where we can promote code directly from Python into the platform and probably a little bit of code polishing, have these things be ready for production. And then we build an API from our production platform to any production system in the company. So our models can be used in real time by any production system in the company. And that was really the key in creating value relatively quickly from everything that we built. So I think it makes greatly satisfactory for data scientists because Everything they build is being used by the company in production every day, right? So I think that creates a certain sense of satisfaction. 
it's great for the business. So, you know, when people ask me, you know, what kind of value are providing, I can point to a dozen or more models that are in production that people are using every day. So it's not a hard question to answer. Definitely. It must be so exciting to show the ROI of a data team. And I'd love to talk about building ML ops teams for hours. But given the topic today and discussing, you know, your work leading data science and New York life insurance, I'd be remiss not to talk about the data culture component when building a high impact data team. You've been very outspoken about the importance of transparency and education when it comes to the data team's work and impact, because it ultimately means both buy-in from decision makers who own different lines of business and practitioners who are on the ground and predominantly relying on their own subject matter expertise. So I'd love to first start off by understanding how you went about getting that buy-in and partnering with these different audiences and getting them excited about the potential of data science. Yeah, that is a very key thing that you know we spend a lot of time on. To me, it's a lot of communication, a lot more than, than you might think in a technical function. So we have a, what I call sort of a multi-level communication approach. So no matter who you are on my team, no matter what level you're on, everybody has a set of stakeholders that we actually define, and we have an exercise about that every once in a while, where we say, okay, these, in my case, probably like 30 or 40 people, in the case of a junior data scientist, maybe eight to 10 people. Those are the relationships you have to maintain. Those are your stakeholders. You have to talk to them often. And you know you have to, over time, make them understand the value of data science for their business problem. But also, you have to understand their business problem. And you have to understand what they worry about every day. Because communication can really only happen when both people understand a little bit of where the other person is coming from. So if you have this sort of multi-level strategy, we get together frequently on the side of my team to actually strategize about who communicates with whom, what are we communicating, and you know how are we basically getting buy-in on what we do. The other principle that I have is I don't disintermediate my data scientists, right? So data scientists do talk directly to business partners. Engineers do talk directly to business partners. There's no like MBA translator in between. I don't believe in that. It does, however, mean that data scientists do have to, you know, learn how to communicate fairly well. There's uh, pros and cons to each of those, but that's the model that we have done. And I guess the third thing I will say is, you know, so first was communication on multi-level and often uh, second thing, no, it is the, it's the mediation of technical people. And then the third is we don't like go away and do our own thing and then come back with a solution, right? So Every project has like weekly project meetings. Everything we do, we communicate to stakeholders right away and get their buy-in often, even on relatively small decisions on a project, such that by the time you're halfway into the project, it is not our project. It is their project. And they speak about it. And when we go to like a status meeting in the business unit or something, I prefer our business partners to present the project and not us to present the project. Because that cements the idea that it's really their project. So by the time you come around the end of it and, you know, a decision gets made on how to deploy it and how fast to deploy it, it's their project. They want to deploy it. It's no longer what we say. And that's the best case. That's such an awesome approach. And following up here, how have you been able to instill this mindset within the data scientists on your team, especially the more technically minded ones, and gear them to be relationship driven and value driven and not just focus on the technical aspects of their work? You know, it's constant reinforcement and it's not right for every single data scientist, right? So we try to recruit the people that are both technically very strong, but also have the desire to solve business problems, the desire to communicate, the desire to teach sometimes, right? The desire to sort of advocate for their craft, so to speak. So recruiting has something to do with it. And then, of course, we do a lot of training, we do a lot of soft skills training, communication training, PowerPoint training. And then there's a lot of on-the-job learning, right? Learning from their manager. Obviously, you know, all of my managers are very strong in that. So people can learn from the managers, they get feedback. It is something we focus on, and, you know, that's how it happens. Another key component of creating a data culture as well is by ensuring that there's a community of practice around data and that folks can feel like they can get involved. So can you walk us through the different ways you've addressed this and how you got the general population at New York Life Insurance excited? There's a lot of sort of community work. So I have two people on my team that do nothing but training and community for the rest of the company. So on the training side, we created this thing we call Data Science Academy. And it is a training program for 
really anybody in the entire company who has some interest in data science. What we have done is we've put uh, sort of curated learning tracks together, mostly using existing online courses that we put together into a track. We also created some of our own content from our projects that we do. And we have learning tracks anywhere from like on the high end, sort of the one year or 10 cores coding based data science uh, learning track. If somebody wants to make a career change in becoming a data scientist, all the way to more of like a business style, you know, non coding multi course track to like a get to know track where if you just want to watch a few videos and look at a few articles about data science, you can do that. More recently, I actually taught myself a half-day data science course for all the executive officers of New York Life. And we got about, those are very high level and busy people. About half of the executive officers actually enrolled voluntarily into a data science course. So that's, you know, the Data Science Academy is one of the most popular learning programs in the entire company today. So that creates a lot of branding for us internally. It also creates people who are interested in data science at the various different business units that we want to collaborate with. And it's always good to have that. It's always good to have somebody to talk to in other units that have an interest in data science. It makes it a lot easier for us to engage. So that's one thing. The second thing there is what we call the data science community. So out of all these people that have some interest in data science in the entire company, you know, we created a mailing list and we have a lot of events. So we put on seminars, lunch and learns, we bring in external speakers, we interview people inside the company, and that is really exciting. And we, in the days of Zoom meetings uh, over the pandemic, we have an average of like 300 people logging on to the Zoom call that is a technical data science seminar. That's a pretty good audience. That part is, is working really well. And then, of course, you know, for my team itself, we have a lot of course technical and non-technical training as well. So that's understood. But this sort of branding effort is more for the entire company. I think it's important, especially in a place like New York Life, where, where data science is just sort of, you know, in the first five years of development. That's fantastic. And I love the degree of personalization that you have in these different learning pathways. There's always a learning track for you, no matter where you are at the organization, but also how you've paid attention to executive training to generate that buy-in. And digging deep on that executive training component, these are folks who are really busy. They have a strong gut instinct that they developed over decades. How do you create a learning program for such an audience? And what does success look like for you in this case? We originally started planning it actually before the pandemic hit, and it was supposed to be in person in a conference room for half a day, you know, with some snack breaks and all of that. Well, you know, then COVID hit and that didn't work out. So we had to re-engineer the entire program for a virtual experience. One of the things I also should mention that we also use in the executive track, we use for other purposes, is for all of the large projects, after the project, we actually create a video. And uh, the video will have people from my team speak. It will have our business partners speak. Might have somebody from technology speak. And it's like a, you know, three to four minute kind of video, not hard to watch, and we can show it everybody, and and that's impactful. So we use the videos also in the executive officer training. We used some general materials around what is data science, how it is applied in various industries, and then I brought a lot of examples from from New York Life data science, which is really relevant to them. And uh, to your question, do you know what does success look like in a training like that? So first of all, if you've done trainings on Zoom, I guess the first criteria is that people keep their camera on and they'll attend, right? So that's uh, actually not as trivial as it sounds. The second thing is, are they asking a lot of questions during the course? But the third thing that's probably the most relevant is, are they coming up with their own ideas of data science projects, right? So after getting an idea of what data science can do, Do they come with their own ideas, you know, at the end of the course or during a discussion in the course and then follow up on those ideas after the course with, you know, a couple of meetings to explore new ideas that they conceived after learning a little more about data science? So we had probably 20 different ideas coming out of these training sessions that they were interested in. So that's how I would measure success of a training program. That's such a great way to think about it, because if you're able to create evangelists out of your partner executives, that will make life much easier for you as a data leader. And harping on the upskilling for the broader population, what are the tools and skills you've prioritized? And how has the upskilling program moved the needle for you when it comes to creating a common data language in the organization? 
so the skills sort of vary depending on the audience there, right? So I think for executive level folks or even like maybe director level folks, if they're all in the non-technical area, like sales or HR or those types of folks, that we just want to create a general understanding of how to recognize a problem where there may be a data science solution, right? So understand enough about data science to recognize a problem that might have a data science solution. And then for a little bit more technical folks, it would be giving them a sense of what data science solutions are looking like. And and even for mid-level folks, giving them an idea of what does it take to build a data science solution as well as the types of people that need to be involved how early do these people need to get involved, you know, before the data is all screwed up and all that. And really, you know, kind of enable them to A, recognize our skill set as data scientists to be different from maybe a business analyst or from an actuary or from an engineer and recognize when they should get us involved and recognize the benefit of getting us involved. Then there was the other cohort of people that are thinking about a career change to data science. For those folks, we have to teach some real data science. You know, that is also something we can do. So we talked about the skill element, the culture element, and to a certain extent, the platform element. But something that cuts across our discussion so far is the importance of building relationships. So you've partnered with a lot of different folks within New York Life Insurance. How do you manage these relationships and who are your main stakeholders? And how do you ensure that the data team's roadmap is aligned with the business's priorities? Yeah, okay. There was a lot of stuff in there. On the relationship side, you know, basically, I mean, everybody on the team has, you know, a set of stakeholders they maintain relationships with, right? I mean, for myself, I probably have regular meetings or lunches or something with, I don't know, maybe 40 or 50 different executive offices in the company, right? Just to kind of understand what's going on in their unit, you know, what are their priorities, where could I potentially help or my team could help and stay on top of what's going on in the business so that we can detect opportunities, you know, as soon as they arise. For folks, you know, that are reporting to me, they have a, a large set of stakeholders also, and they want to be a little more tactical and say, okay, you know, what projects are you starting? What's coming next year? How can we help? What's the status of current projects we're engaged in? Is everybody happy? Are you happy? Are your people happy? You know, to keep that going. For more individual contributor types on my team, it will be the stakeholders of a particular project to make sure they talk to them, not just in official meetings, but maybe, you know, have a lunch with them, have a one-on-one meeting with them to just make sure that we're hitting the mark, we're on the right track, they understand what we're doing, there's no gaps in knowledge or understanding, uh, no gaps in goals. You know, that's kind of the practical way that we do that on, on the communication side. Now, on the planning side, that's, I think, the other part of your question, there needs to be budget alignment. When I say deployment, you know, it's nice to have a platform to deploy all the models, but deploying models is not free, right? You also have to have the budget to deploy. It. So, you know, in our annual financial planning process, I mean, I don't only have to worry about my own budget. That's complex enough. But I have to worry about the budget of every one of my business partners, too, and make sure they have budgeted for the deployment of our models into their environment so that that will actually happen. You know, so there was a lot of coordination going on during the planning process and the budgeting process to make sure that, you know, we have to budget on the tech side, we have to budget on the business side to actually get models deployed in the coming year. And that's very important. There's definitely a lot of complexity in managing these relationships. And speaking of complexity, I'd love it if you can also walk us through the challenges in working with data within an industry that is highly regulated. And how do you ensure that you're consistently innovating responsibly? That's a very interesting and I guess more relevant topic every year. I mean, I want to make maybe two points on that one. One is I mean, regulation is there to protect consumers, right? So, I mean, New York Live as a company is very much aligned with that. In fact, you know, we're not a you know, market-traded company. We're what's called a mutual company. So New York Live is actually owned by the policyholders of New York Live. So we're essentially owned by our customers. So hence, our philosophy is very much to do right by our customers. And that is at least in principle, you know, the purpose of regulation as well. Uh, so we appreciate uh, well thought out regulation and we're quite happy, you know, to follow that and influence that in the right way. It's very much aligned with our company. So that's the first point. The second point for, you know, engineers and data scientists is, 
the uh, compliance with regulation is not boring at all. It actually creates a lot of interesting analytical challenges in its own right. So when you think about you know, disparate impact testing for protected classes, that creates a whole new set of uh, algorithms that you have to develop to do this intelligently, right? Because disparate impact is not sort of a, you know, black and white thing. It's very, it's complex. Disparate impact of a model, well, a model is multivariate. Which pieces of that model are actually creating or not creating some potential disparate impact? How do you analyze that in a multivariate situation? There's a complex modeling algorithm behind it. Where do you draw the line? It's not a qualitative concept. In practice, it's quantitative. The very important line between, you know, some correlation that might indicate disparate impact versus not. So it creates a lot of interesting analytical challenges. I'd say that, you know, the head of my model government team is probably one of the most interesting positions on the whole team. That's a great way of framing it, you know, where constraints add a new layer of complexity and intrigue for different types of data science projects. So can you walk me through the process of setting up a model governance team and the lessons that you can share with other data leaders here? We set up a government's model governance team probably about two or three years ago. You know, once sort of the uh, organization was mature enough to meet our own headcount on that, it's what I call the first line of defense, right? So I have my own model governance team, first line of defense. Then the company has a corporate model governance team. That's the second line of defense. And every model gets validated on my team. So every model that gets built gets validated by people that had no involvement in building. That's independent validation. We look at data validation, we look at model validation, and then of course we look at any kinds of regulation or legislation that you know this may be subject to, depending on the use case and the data that's in it. So the leader of my model governance team has to be a very good data scientist who actually understands all the algorithms and the data, but also is directly connected to our government affairs team and the company and the legal team to understand the regulation legislation, not just of today, but of tomorrow, because these models we built, they should be in production for many years. So we have to look at, you know, what is being proposed as legislation in the state of Ohio, you know, in the next year or something like that, right? Don't is also speed regulated, so we don't just have one regulator. I mean, the federal government is also a regulator, but we also have 50 other regulators, you know, one in every state. So that makes it a pretty interesting job. That's really fascinating. Now, Glenn, as we are reaching the end of our episode, I'd love to ask you a few questions before we close out. The first one is, what would be your advice for any up-and-coming data scientists fielding choices between joining tech or more, you know, quote-unquote traditional industries such as finance or insurance? There is sort of the misconception uh, that I want to debunk a little bit that, you know, if it's a tech company, it's exciting. If it's, you know, an insurance company, it's boring. That's not true at all, right? What you should look at, you know, what is the specific job and what kind of thing are you going to work on, right? Because if they make 95% of their business model from advertising, 95% of what a data scientist is going to work on is a maximization of advertising. Revenue. So an individual job, you know, might be focusing on optimizing one single search term for the next year, right? So a lot of these large tech companies have done this for a decade or more. So you're building the 17th version of that model, right? Whereas at a place like New York Life, you know, you're building the first version of a model that has never been tackled before in a variety of different challenges. The company is old, you know, 175 years old, but the challenges we tackle from a data science perspective we're often tackling for the first time. Look at the specific job. Don't just look at the company. Look at what you're actually going to be working on, are you building the first model, the second model, or the 15th model in that area? What kind of interesting data do you get to work with? What kind of variety of models and other data science solutions are you going to build? Those are the people you're going to learn from. And then, you know, obviously, the, the most important thing is the data science function set up for success, meaning are they deploying all their models into a business and actually get the benefit out? Because if they're not doing that, probably means that the existence of that data science function will eventually be questioned. And given the exciting use cases of data science and AI and insurance that we just discussed, what are some of the trends you're particularly excited about that will impact the insurance space? Yeah, I mean, you know, like you said, we can talk a long time about MLOps. So I think MLOps is a huge trend and we're just at the beginning of that journey and it's already made such a big improvement in the way data science functions in reality. Right? I mean, now we have good platforms that we can deploy models on, 
those platforms will probably get even better. There'll be more of an integrated way that you know integrates even better with the model development. The thing that we're, we're actually investing a bit of money into now is what happens post deployment of the model in terms of software solutions, right? So with the model production, it's running. Now, you know, you should monitor that model. I have a monitoring function that we put in place in the last two years. And uh, so every model now gets monitored, both for things like data drift and score drift. If something goes wrong with incoming data, somebody gets alerted right away before we make a bunch of bad decisions. And then also reporting. So, you know, we want to wait a model. After the model gets deployed, our business partners want to know that they're actually going to get the value that we promised, right? So we have to do a bunch of reporting on that production model. We'd like to not write custom code for all of that would be a lot of work. So we've been, you know, looking at software and actually we made a software decision that helps us monitor and report on models in production. So that's all part of sort of the MLOps process. And I think, you know, MLOps engineer is probably uh, one of the hottest professions right on the same level as data scientists. That's great. Now, Glenn, as we close out, do you have any final call to action before we wrap up today's episode? Like some of the things I said, if you want to kind of learn more over time, definitely feel free to connect on LinkedIn with me. I'm always happy to provide material to the community. I post pretty actively on LinkedIn. So that's a way to stay in touch. Also, you know, I would be of a miss to not mention the job opportunities on the team. So I frequently have openings on the team on all the different skill sets that I mentioned. So data science and ops engineers, data engineers, project managers, model governance at many different levels. We also have a, a large internship program that we run every summer. And recently, we started a what we call an associate program. So starting this year, we actually hire several people with a bachelor's degree in a technical area. And then they spend three years on my team, rotating through a few different jobs, and at the same time, doing a master's degree for which we pay the tuition. So that's yet another you know, great way to join the team and become a data scientist. Thank you so much, Glenn, for coming on Data Framed. Thanks so much for having me. You've been listening to Data Framed, a podcast by DataCamp. Keep connected with us by subscribing to the show in your favorite podcast player. Please give us a rating, leave a comment, and share episodes you love. That helps us keep delivering insights into all things data. Thanks for listening. Until next time.